For those of you who don't know, we have a panel here of real progressive uh, giants um, from our movement in Israel. And so I'm hoping that we can hear from you uh, your wisdom as well about not, as Yitzi said, what's left of the left, because all of us here in the room know that there's a lot left on the left. And so the question that I really hope we can get at is what's left for us to do on the left and what's needed of us um, in these moments. So just by way of very brief introduction, um, to my left <laughs> uh, is advocate Leah Tzemel. Um, she, Leah is the inveterate Israeli human rights lawyer and the subject of the film Advocate by directors uh, Rachel Leah Jones and Philip Belaish. I would say you're the, the matriarch of the Israeli human rights sector. Um, to her left, uh, former member of Knesset Dov Hanin from the Hadash Party. Um, Dov is an activist for peace, socioeconomic and environmental justice, and the subject of the film Comrade Dov by director Barack Hyman. To his left, <laughs> uh, Barack Hyman, an award-winning Israeli filmmaker, uh, director, producer, and teacher. He's the creator of the documentary film Comrade Dov, which is here at Other Israel. To his left, Mira Awad, who we just heard from. <laughs> yeah. Um, Palestinian Israeli singer, songwriter, actress, TV content creator, creativity and performance coach, artist, artivista, which we will get into a bit later, um, and creator of Muna. So I want to start this panel by sort of asking each of you to connect your work um, to the existing left progressive movement, however you want to define it. I'm going to start with Dov. Um, and I want to ask you, Dov, after serving for 12 years in public office, um, when you announced that you wouldn't seek re-election in April's election, you said, I've managed to enact laws, but I failed to change the country's direction. The attacks on democracy haven't diminished. So can you tell us how you decided to stop fighting your fight for justice inside the halls of Knesset and why you decided to fight it elsewhere? Some people were saying, oh, Dove retired. But those of us who know you know that that was not the story at all. So please tell us what the story actually was there. Well, thank you all uh, for coming. And thank the, thank the organizers of this amazing event. And thank you, Libby for all, your, all your, your support. I'm very proud to be part of this panel. Um, well, I think that the Americans in this audience, which is the ma great majority, perhaps know the ancient story about Woodrow Wilson, who used to be a law professor at Princeton, and back in 1912, uh, left the university, ran for office, and was elected to be the president of the United States. A journalist came to him and asked him, Professor Wilson, why did you decide to leave university? And Wilson answered, well, I just got tired of politics. <laughs> so, in a way, I'm in the contrary position. I left the Knesset in order to do more politics. It's a bit strange to hear, but I'll try to explain it as briefly as I can. The Knesset is an extremely important place. Being in the Knesset, I, I think I was effective as a Knesset member. I was able to pass through more than 100 different laws that are at, at the moment in Israeli books, books of law, which is a great, numbers of, great number of laws. The, the number, of, co of course, is, is very big. It's even the biggest among Knesset members. But it's not very important because what is important is the content of the law, uh, the laws, um, feminist laws, human rights law, workers' rights uh, uh, laws, LGBTs, um, environmental legislation, animals' rights, and many, many others. So, in a way, I was effective in the Knesset, but also I, when I tried to sum up the 12 years I've been in the Knesset, or more than 12 years, I um, had to ask myself uh, sincere questions and to try to answer sincerely to myself. When I entered the Knesset, I entered the Knesset in, in order to change the, the direction of Israeli society. Now, in these 12 years, I asked myself, did Israeli society become more just? Perhaps it become, became 
less corrupt or even less, less racist or perhaps we got closer to, to the most important challenge we have and that is a just solution and a just peace between Israel and our Palestinian uh, and Arab neighbors. Actually, the answer to all these questions is unfortunately negative. We just got further away from all these uh, very important goals. Now, the second question I ask myself is uh, why if the, you know, my mark at the finishing um, uh, certificate uh, is so uh, failing one, uh, what is the reason for this failure? Is it connected to the fact that I didn't put enough effort or perhaps I wasn't resolute enough or wasn't you know, keen enough to, to do things? And my answer to all this is negative too because I think that all these um, years I did whatever I could, you know? Whatever I could, I did there. I put all the effort I could uh, put in this endeavor. And so the reason is not that I was, not, uh, that I was just a, a lousy member of Knesset. <laughs> a, another uh, explanation might be that it is impossible to change Israeli society. And I have to tell you very openly that I do not accept this explanation. I do not accept this explanation, not because Israeli society is not difficult and complicated and there are many problems and many dangers and many threats and many horrible things happen, unfortunately, in, in our country, but because in Israel too, as elsewhere in the world, there are people, there are people struggling, there are people wanting to achieve change, there are many, many social, environmental and political struggles existing in our country. And so, besides problems and threats, I do see real possibilities in Israeli society also. So, the answer I got to uh, give myself in the end is that although the Knesset is an extremely important place, in order to change the direction of Israeli society, we should change the direction of the streams under the, the boat. And in order to change the streams, we should go to the streets, to the neighborhoods, to the public, and try to build the change from below. Now, if that is the most important thing we should do, I do not like the attitude of, well, this is the most important thing, so please, mister, let, let you do it. If that is the most important thing to do, I want to take my share and to try to help uh, to do uh, whatever needed to change our society and our state. Thank you. Mira, oh, yeah, please. Mira, um, as a Palestinian Israeli artivista um, and a maker of culture across so many disciplines and media, you've managed to build an audience that's full of bridges and connections between sometimes very unlikely kinds of people. I saw your performance in Tel Aviv a couple of months ago called Narratives, and I was looking around that theater and thinking, how are all of these different people actually sitting here in this theater? And I wanna ask you, since Dove was sort of starting to talk about Israeli society and what's needed, my question to you is, um, is that audience that you're building through these all these different kinds of art, is that a political strategy for you? Is that a left-wing political strategy for you? Uh, definitely, <laughs> first of all. Uh, I, I wanna add to my resume uh, that you said that when Dov uh, <laughs> was nominated for mayor in Tel Aviv, I was his number 13 in the list. <laughs> the most important number. <laughs> I knew nobody else was gonna take that number. <laughs> I said, okay, give me 13, I'm gonna take 13. So, um, uh, yes, yes, my answer is yes, and this did not happen just one night or from the beginning. When I started my artistic career, which is uh, long ago, which is when I was born, <laughs> practically, uh, I just wanted to be an artist. I did not want to represent anyone. I didn't want to 
bring narratives. I just wanted people to hear music and say, wow, that's amazing. I wanted, I wanted them to hear a song that I wrote and, you know, delve into the lyrics and hear the melismas and, you know, like admire what I did musically. But that was not the case because every time I would be interviewed on, especially of course on Israeli media, the story was the Arab girl from the village who is now in Tel Aviv. Uh, you know, that, so they would want, uh, all of them wanted to come with me to the village because I don't know, they thought we had donkeys or something. And, uh, and then they wanted to, to do this, you know, collage of me in, in the village and in Tel Aviv and how I'm now emancipated in Tel Aviv, right? So uh, in the beginning, I really, I was trying to like, no, let's talk about the music. That, and what, it ha what eventually ha ended up happening is that they went on, I did not answer the questions, they went on and wrote whatever they had in their own head of a picture of, of me, of who I am, about this fugitive girl from the village in Tel Aviv, you know, that I had freed myself in the, in the modern lifestyle in Tel Aviv, whatever. Um, and little by little, I realized that if I didn't take control over the narrative, they're going to keep on inventing my story. And that's when I started to understand that I need to tell the story. And the more I did it, I understood that the story can be told in many ways, and most importantly, through the art. So if I used to write all kinds of songs about weather, I never wrote with like a weather as a metaphor. What is it? What doesn't matter? So, it's like, uh, so now almost everything that I do is about telling the story, telling the story of the complexity of identity, of narratives, of diversity of narratives, of the importance of having diversity of narratives, uh, of solidarity, human solidarity, uh, women's rights, children's rights, we're all in the same pile. Um, and yes, it is a tactic. I do have a tactic. When I go on a panel on TV, I want people to listen. So yes, I have strategies where I make them listen. I don't want to antagonize people. I don't want to shock them. I don't want to be a sensation. I want them to listen. So I smile and I tell them a personal story. And it's all, you know, storytelling tactics. And I believe in that. I want them to listen. I want to be able to open a small window for them to look through. So of course I'm not gonna be representing all of my community. Of course I'm not gonna be able to tell a full story, but if they listen, you know, I am able to be on Galeit Sahal, which is the IDF radio, and talk about my father being expelled from his village in 48 when the country was established, and I'm not shut down. That means they are listening. Now, what effect does it have? I have no control on that. But I want that opening. I want that chance to say that. So if one listener or one interviewer looks at me and says, hmm, I never heard that story being told like that. And now I understand something that I never thought about. I've done my thing. That's what I feel. Thank you. <laughs> so. So, Leia, uh, you're the subject of the film Advocate, which opened the festival, so many of us in the room have seen it, and it really follows um, the fascinating story of your life and your work as a human rights attorney in Israel, defending people that nobody wanted to defend, that nobody would defend, and to give them voice, or at least um, to, uh, to be a source for them to have some kind of a voice somewhere, and I want to ask you about that. What do you think the role of human rights uh, work and legal advocacy is in the left in Israel? <clears throat> uh, I think I'm trying to do what I think is the real role. But I wanted to relate more to the subject, to the very beautiful headline of this evening, what, what's left. And I thought at home, what am I going to talk about? Usually I like, I prefer to come with some very optimistic message and uh, looking at the rainbow in front of us. And at home when I sat and then in the plane, on the plane I thought, what am I going to, to talk about? And uh, 
yeah, we are now in a very, very bad situation. The left is what, or what's left of the left, and the, there is a basis. And uh, we feel very, very um, well the, the way the right wing is taking over, the way the fascization of so many people in so many positions is there, the way that uh, we lost, until now at least, the b battle on the settlements, and they are becoming bigger and stronger. And uh, we feel, at least I feel it in my field everywhere, more, more settlers are judges, are prosecutors, are policemen, are in the higher uh, deg degrees of the army. They, take, they make decisions and they create very well our lives. And uh, I feel total failure in this field. We did not deliver what we wanted to do. Uh, I thought of telling you about some really optimistic things that do happen. It's true. And I'm uh, privileged enough to be part of it because of my profession as a lawyer. So yes, I do represent those Sheikh Jarrah demonstrators. They demonstrate once a week in Sheikh Jarrah against uh, taking the houses from the Arab population, returning in a way to the Jewish organizations. Um, I would like to talk to you about them, but I know that it's not what, what was there five years ago. Five years ago, the struggle was really large, big, many participants. Now, it's just keeping the, the torch burning, but not that, that big um, fire. Uh, yes, I'm called once or twice a week, and mainly weekends and nights, to defend those of uh, Tayush who are in the occupied territories trying to push back the settlers. So I'm very proud to do it. I'm happy that I can do something about it, but not too much, I'm afraid. And recently, I received a new energy shot when I uh, represented the uh, Ethiopians for the demonstrations, you know the case, I'm sure. And uh, I, I found out this extremely beautiful, excellent, uh, existing, energetic women who run practically, together with men, but they, I think they are the vivid <coughs> power behind it, the, the demonstrations, they will not break. Yeah, so there are some highlights that I wanted to bring about. Generally, I was not going to speak in such optimism around here, but I brought with me uh, your book, when he retreated from the Knesset just then, right? He wrote a book of what to do, the how to operate this change. And I must say that uh, I can drive some optimism from there. Thank you. <laughs> not little, not little. You explain it so nicely, you explain the world, you explain Israel inside this world, and our bright horizon, perhaps. <laughs> so uh, you'll talk about it yourself, I'm sure, about your vision. But um, this is a light in this dark tunnel. Sorry. Thank you, Leah. We can all yeah. we can all take a deep breath, and I really appreciate not getting a sugar-coated picture. So thank you for that. Barack, so the 20 plus films and TV series that you've directed or produced or been a part of have spanned a huge range of issues. Uh, from Bridge Over the Vadi, which um, follows a group of uh, Arab and Jewish parents um, in their decision to establish a bilingual school for their children, to Who's Gonna Love Me Now, the story of an HIV-positive uh, former paratrooper living in London, 
to Lady Kul El Arab, the story of Angelina, the first Druze woman to make significant steps in the Israeli fashion world, to Mr. Gaga, which follows the iconic choreographer and my friend, Ohad Narin. Uh, and so I want to ask you, with, with public opinion, like when we're here and we're reading about Israeli public opinion, we read about some pretty worrying trends um, in terms of how people in Israel are viewing each other and the world. And I want to ask you how you think documentary film and television can play a role in the broader work of building social change. And are your stories supposed to be, and are they a part of that social change? Thank you for the question, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, yes, I think it is part, part of this revolution, or part of this struggle. And we all try our very best to do whatever we can. So Dov was a parliament member for many years, and he was advocate by himself, and he's an activist. And she's doing amazing jobs that uh, not many other people are willing to do, if at all. And she's an artivist, and I'm a filmmaker. So we all try to do whatever we can. Um, do films change the world? Can art change the reality? The answer is absolutely not, in my opinion. I don't think so. Um, we had an amazing film, um, not, I didn't make it, so this is why I can say it's amazing, The Gatekeepers. It was nominated to the Oscar, and it told the story of six uh, head of Shin Bet. They are all saying the same thing. They are all saying something very, very uh, radical in a way. And um, it, it should be in the in, um, sane world, it should change the reality. It should change the politics. And so many people have watched it, and it didn't change anything. But still, it changed some people's minds. So our film, for example, Komradov, about this gentleman, um, and now I'm telling you something very optimistic, um, that almost 100 public discussions, almost 100 Q&As we did in the past four and a half months in Israel, and our calendar is booked for the next six months. Um, so people are willing to listen, and people um, are happy to listen. Uh, does it change the reality? Does it change the politics? Absolutely not. But I remember when I made the film Bridge Over the Vadi, um, which was screened here in other Israel Film Festival, and I asked uh, Noha, she was the, the Arab principal of the school, it was more than 15 years ago. Noah, what is your dream about this school? It was the first time to have such a Jewish Arab school located inside an Arab village. And she said, I, I'm not going to change the world with this uh, school. I'm not going to change the reality in Israel or outside of Israel. But I'm going to give hope for those 100 families so they are able to to give their children different life. So in, for, for me, I am able to make films. This is almost the only thing I know how to do. And I'm trying to bring my values and my ideology into those films and to try to, to touch the heart, mainly the heart. It's even more important for me than the brain. It's to touch the heart through emotions of people and, and maybe to open their heart a bit to different ideas, to different uh, values, to different ideologies, in this case that Dov is representing. And I think that big revolutions start with a very, very little steps. So I hope to be one of those steps. Thank you. And thank you for acknowledging that thing called the heart, because I think when we, when we talk about the left and when people are um, polled about their views about the left, you know, this idea that the left is there to convince everyone about what's true and right with the facts um, sometimes misses that very important thing called the heart. So thank you for that. Um, so I have this, this um, concept in my head. He's called the average Yossi. And the average Yossi is like, you know, kind of Joe average Israeli who wants to have a, you know, good life and raise his kids and go to his job. Um, and so I want to ask you about like the reaction to you, because each of you is a very political person and known in Israel to be a very political person. So I kind of want to ask you, like, how are you regarded by my average Yossi? 
Um, and of course, the average Yossi is a myth, right? Because there's so many different kinds of Israelis. But my question is like, how are you perceived um, for your work? And I want to start with you, Mira, because just like on the previous panel that you were just on, the Q&A for Muna, you talked about your experience representing Israel in the Eurovision with Achinoam Nini. And so like, there were a lot of reactions to you in Israel. And I want to know what your experience of those reactions is today. Well, I stopped reading them, <laughs> first of all. I stopped reading them, which is very good for my health. Uh, I'm not kidding. Um, yeah, um, people, um, well, as you said, there's no average Yossi, really. And uh, the number of people is the number of opinions. So naturally, some people like what I represent, and some people like really, really, really detest what I represent. If for several reasons, by the way, or different reasons. Some detest it because it's too left-wing. Some detest it because I'm just Arab. Some detest it because I'm a woman speaking up, which is something that a lot of people don't really like. Um, I get a lot of comments like, shut up and just sing. And I'm saying, like, you can't do that. <laughs> Physically, you can't shut up and sing. <laughs> So I can't, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> they want me to be, in the, in, the, in the two episodes, whoever was here, like the, the pet Arab, the pet uh, a nice uh, girl who is like, you look nice, you're one of us, right? So don't start talking about politics again. And I get these people on Facebook, like whenever I do put something political, oh, there you go again. You were nice yesterday when we talked about the kids, but now you're like political again. So, and I get that from both sides, naturally, from the Israeli Jewish side and from the Arab side, because also there's a diversity of opinions on the Arab side, the Palestinian side, or the whole Arab side. So some of them don't like the fact that I'm so liberal, or some of them think I'm too, you know, Israeli or too Jewish or too sympathetic with Jewish people or with Israeli or da da da, -da. Um, but some of them look up and say, thank you for saying what I, for conveying what I think about. And you have the microphone in front of you and you can say something while I'm at home raising kids and I can't. So it's, it's a diversity of things. And eventually, you know, I choose to hang on to the support because it's a choice. I can be bitter because there are bitter people in the world, or I can hang on to the people who need that slither of hope that I can provide in order to keep myself positive, in order to get myself up in the morning and doing something, because otherwise I'm gonna not do anything. And with time, I made a choice. I made a choice that I'm not gonna try and speak to a huge audience all over the world, no. I'm going to speak to the audience, that audience that needs me in order to stay hopeful. I am dedicating myself to them. They are the people that I am singing to, writing series, uh, TV series to, I am here on this panel for, in order to keep them hopeful. Because if we lose the hope, seriously, then it's going to be very dark. And I need us to keep the hope up. And if I can help do that, that's what I'm going to do. Thank you. So, Dove, I, there, I don't understand the average Yossi's reaction to you. Um, I don't know if people saw the trailer for Comrade Dove, but it's something unbelievable. This is somebody with what all of us could agree is left-wing politics in all the ways, true left. And in the trailer, one by one by one, members of Knesset from the radical right and all the way through across the political spectrum, Arabs and Jews, settlers, non, the president of the state, they're all speaking lovingly about you. I want to know, like, <laughs> how does that happen? And is that reflective of, you know, the average EOC or the average EOCs and their reaction to you as a politician? Well. Uh, first of all, in a way, yes, I think. Um, but let, let me begin with 
for me, political activity means two things, not only one. The first and the most important is sticking to your values, your opinions, your ideals. You know the very famous story about uh, Groucho Marx, who once said, well, these are my opinions, but if you do not like them, I also have others. <laughs> Uh, I, do not, I do not accept this way of thinking. I came to political activity because of my values and I stick with my values. And that is the most important thing. But there is one other thing which is very, very important in political activity and that is the struggle and the, the strive to speak with people, to be able to come to people who think differently who are very, very far away, politically, to be with them in their struggles, in their problems, in their you know, anger, to be with them in their mistakes, and to try to move forward with them. That is, for me, the most important challenge. I came to political activity not in order to quarrel with people, but in order to change reality. And that is something very different. Uh, so, well, m the average OC is the person I meet in uh, public transport. I always use public transport back in Tel Aviv or in Israel. And um, there are more difficult times, uh, like when we have wars and, you know, I, of, of course, oppose uh, the wars in, in Gaza and in Lebanon. And uh, those are, you know, more bitter times. People may be very angry, but uh, for me it is an opportunity, you know, because we are together in a bus. They cannot run away. <laughs> they, they, they open the subject. So it's an opportunity to have, a, you know, a public meeting in a, in a, in a bus or in a train and uh, to try to speak with people about what is happening. Uh, and when you are willing to listen and when you respect the other people, even though I think they are wrong, um, a discussion can be, can be created. And... Um, it is, you know, when people shout, the most important thing is to uh, be more quiet. <laughs> and uh, when uh, people, you know, um, bring very, very harsh statements, the most important uh, tactic is to use questions and to question them very quietly. And I think that uh, speaking with people and discussing with people is essentially very, very important. Now, speaking about the members of Knesset, well, in order to create change, you, ha you have to cooperate with people who are very, very different and far away politically than you. Uh, that does not mean that I give, my, give up my values or I give up my opinions, but I can go along with a very right-wing settler member of Knesset against police violence, for example. He has his own reasons why he's against police violence, but police violence is very bad, and it is a problem in Israel. And if I want to be effective in struggling against police violence, I should cooperate even with members of Knesset from the right-wing who has from his own, from his own uh, you know, angle, problem with this, uh, this issue. So um, I try to cooperate with whoever I can on things that can pr pr uh, give, give, give us some changes in our reality. And I think it is very connected with the fact that you know, subjectively, I feel very confident about my ideals, about my vision, about my opinions. So I'm not really threatened by cooperating with others. I think that uh, in a way they cooperate with me and it, they cooperate with me more than I cooperate with them. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so Barack, I want to ask you also to maybe pick up where Dove left off about, and actually you started to talk about the reaction to the film, but I, I don't want to leave it only at this film because in the last few days I've also watched your speeches online at prizes that you've won and things like that for other films and television um, in Israel. And this, this is, not is what you do in your free time. Are yeah, you I know, crazy? It's sad. I'm preparing <laughs> for this panel for like two weeks. Um, no, I I am really curious though about the response to you as a political um, culture maker in Israel and whether you feel any of that and also the response to Comrade Dov. Yeah. So let me start with Comrade Dov because I, I think, I, I don't know how you did it, you, you, are, uh, you are a witch because there was a guy named Yossi. Oh. Listen, you, so you say average Yossi and you never met him. So I don't know how you, how you, how you felt it in Been your body. Been preparing for two weeks. But this is a true story. <laughs> it's crazy. Like when the film Comrade Dov just came out, it was after uh, Doc Aviv International Film Festival in Tel Aviv, and then we released it in cinema, theatrically. And in one of the very first public screenings in Lev Cinema, there was a man, later on I realized that his name is Yossi, and he was sitting there, about 70, 75 years old, uh, wearing a yarmulke. Um, you could feel in his body movement, body language that is not so comfortable with the content of the film. Um, but, but nevertheless, he stayed all the way until the end of the film and even until the very end of the Q&A. He didn't want to go, but you could feel that he's going through a storm inside of him. And I asked him, hey, do you need a glass of water? Do you need any help? What's going on? Are you okay? And he said, I must talk to you. I must talk to you. I said, okay, I love to talk to people. What, what's going on? He said, I must be honest with you, Barak. I'm here completely by accident. I would never, never, never choose such a film. <laughs> no way. I said, so why are you here? What do you mean accident? He said, I came with my wife uh, to go to a movie and the uh, tickets were sold out. And in the, box in the box office, the girl told me that there is a movie called Hachaver, the friend, comrade. She didn't say comrade, though. I don't know why. And I love friends. I really love friends. <laughs> So, so I went to see the movie, and I would never go to see such a movie because I'm such a person, he, he, he tells about himself, that whenever I see on TV any lefty or any Arab person, I immediately switch off. I turn off the TV because I don't like those people. And I don't understand what's happening to me. My head is spinning like <laughs> this guy Dove. I don't, I don't agree with him about anything, and I don't think there is ever going to be peace between us and the Arabs. But what could I do? I felt in love with him. <laughs> he, he's a good man. He's a good man. What to do, Barack? What to do? <laughs> I said, you don't have to do anything. Just go home and send all your friends to come to watch the film. <laughs> so I don't know if it answered your question, but... Um, it doesn't matter. It was a really good story. Yes. <laughs> and so he, he, was, he was definitely Yossi. I don't know if he's average. But um, I, I, I get reactions like this. Um, there was another woman at the end of one of the screenings telling me, uh, hey, I came here not because I wanted, just because my, my daughter, she is voting for merits, and, and she pushed me to come to the cinema, and I'm right wing, and, and I must tell you that, wow, I'm, I'm completely in a different place right now. And I said, what do you mean right? And she said, right, right, I mean very right. <laughs> and, and now I'm, I'm really, I'm going through something because of this film, and I think that every Israeli st pupil, student, have to watch this film. So those are the good... Are yeah. yeah, yeah, it's in Facebook, and I asked her permission, of course, both of them, by the way, and, and both of them agreed, yes, go ahead. So this is the good part. The, the, the negative part, or not negative, but different side or different angle, is people who are telling me, but why do you mix your political agenda with your artistic uh, talent or vision or whatever? And I said, what do you mean? Why, why should I wake up in the morning if I'm not able to bring my politics inside my art, inside my, my movie? And, and for me, the film about Dove is completely a political action. And, and as I told you before, I don't think it's going to bring peace to the Middle East or to change the politics, but it is definitely going to make a little, little change together with the work of Lea and with the work of uh, my friend Mira and with the great work of many other people 
all together, if, if, we share, if we hold hands, I think there is a potential of something good to happen. Thank you. Um, so the, the story of the film Advocate, and I'm not talking about the story that it tells, but the story of the film and what's happening with the film is a little bit different in that um, it's become very controversial. The minister, as you know, the minister of culture is going after it constantly, trying to get it censored, trying to get it pulled from festivals, and <laughs> without ever seeing it, and sometimes succeeding. And so I want to ask you, Leia, about, um, about that, about what that response has been like for you. And also, like, is it a simple picture, or is it more complex than what the headlines are saying? I wanted to join the feeling of others about what's going on really on a daily basis with the people around. And my Yossi is always in uniform. It can be the guards of the uh, prisoners who bring them in and out. The policemen whom I see day by day and we are fighting together in the court. The judges, the military judges in their uniform or the civil judges with the black gown, and uh, all those people on a daily basis, if Rachel Lear Jones, the one who directed the, the film, was here, she would say, they, she said it a few times already, so I'm citing her, uh, they love to hate her and they hate to love her. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is really the, what I feel on a personal level, not in the meat, in the, uh, media or in the mass media, I don't know the people, but on a daily basis with all those people, I fight. I, um, they know exactly what I think. I, I wear my heart on my sleeve very clearly. Uh, I tell them what I think about them, what I think about the situations. They come and ask me, so what do you know? So what do you think and how, etc." And I, I do answer and uh, they accept it. They, are, they get used to, to, to hear it, very similar to what you described in your bus. So I'm in this bus day by day. And uh, I cannot tell you that I even hate the, the policeman or the security services person whom I know that was torturing my client, etc. No, because something about being together in the same boat, after all, makes another contact. Now, about the film and all the reactions, I, I was surprised. I didn't think that's what will happen. And I also can feel the um, bags of hatred, of course. I can read it. I, you should, after every f movie, when, when it's been controversial, you can read in the, I don't, I don't have Facebook, I don't look at Facebook, but. You can read there what people really feel and, and uh, how they wish my death or my children's death and my grandchildren's death and everything around me. And uh, sometimes if people call the office and curse, I come back to them and I say, hey, you wanted to talk to me? Here I am, let's talk over the phone. And then they are ashamed and they withdraw usually. Uh, so the feeling is, if we had uh, these face-to-face -face debates every time, it would be different. If it's, it doesn't happen, it's full of hatred, really. Thanks. Well, and you should know, and I hope that Rachel and Philippe also know that here in this room, we're supportive. And, you know, Carol has been insisting that we talk about this film and what's happening with the film, and many, many of us have at the New Israel Fund and beyond. Um, and so we don't take things like censorship lightly, and, uh, and I, it was important for me to say that. Um, Just please. Because you said, I wanted to say that but I can. us sitting here talking to you is really talking to the hard core of the supporters of our future. And I really feel I'm here because I want, to, I want us to get together, really, to do things, mainly. So I'm uh, going to... Libby, I would, like to, <laughs> yeah. I would like to add 
that uh, on the one hand, there is this uh, very, very vicious attack of uh, Minister of Culture in Israel against the film The Advocate. But on the other hand, we can see a courageous um, manifestations, activities, uh, showings of the films in different places, uh, people not giving up not giving up and not giving in and fighting to, to see the film and to show the film. It, it is very, very encouraging in a way. I agree. Um, I want to take some questions from people in the audience. I'm going to start with you here. If, if the Ministry of Culture is so, well, so against everything that you people have presented, how are you getting funding? I thought that she was trying to prevent everybody from functioning, and that they had to swear their allegiance and all this other nonsense. So how did you get the funding? So how do we make art even in this moment with the Ministry of Culture? And I want to so take- How are they getting the funding? That's what I'm asking. Uh -huh. Luckily, uh, there are islands of sanity in this mad madness. Um, so Comrade Dov, for example, uh, I got uh, funded by uh, Yes, Doko. It's the documentary channel of the satellite, um, and also by the new f foundation of TV and cinema. Um, I don't know if forever it will be able to be like this. There is a danger, but for now, both me and Rachel and Philip, who made the film Advocate, we were able, absolutely. Let's take a question from Gil that raised his hand in the front here. Uh, this entire panel is based on the premise that Israel has been moving steadily to the right. No one has actually tried to explain why that is the case, and I know it's a much bigger subject that can be addressed here, but if someone, Chaber Knesset Kenin, to choose one spokesman, could try to tell us in very briefly why it is that Israeli society, despite the efforts of heroes like Leah Semel and, and the rest of you, continue, and, and continues to move, to move to the right. Thanks for the question. Dov, do you want to give that one a shot? Uh, well, very briefly, I think that uh, the biggest problem we have in our country is the ongoing, very deep, and very vicious national conflict. You know, we, we live in a situation of occupation of more than 50 years of the Palestinians and the Palestinian territories. And Actually, Israel in, is in a constant state of war because of the crazy policies of, unfortunately, our leaderships. And I, th I have to tell you that in such a situation, right-wing tendency is happening everywhere. In a situation of conflict and national, nation, deep national conflict and wars, I think that right-wing tendencies are, are gaining the upper hand. And uh, so, uh, in a way, all of us are uh, swimming against the stream in our society. And it is very, very important to swim against the stream, but uh, it may, might be very, very difficult. If I may add another point, and this is the, uh, the fact that people normally, in spite of your uh, remarks that you will do and you are doing correctly, still they live, uh, even in the settlements, they're flourishing. They get money, they get all the budgets, many, much, much uh, money and influence, and uh, they, they are really effective nowadays, everywhere. They have the politicians with them. If there is a settlement, an illegal so-called settlement uh, by some young uh, Meshige in, in, on the mountains <laughs> on Palestinian soil, they will be supported by politicians. They will be supported by those who will affect the army not to, not to destroy the settlement, etc., etc. That's how it works. They are, I would say, riding on the horses and also shout at the same time. Does anyone else want to jump in on this, or can we take another question? Okay, let's see if there's another question. Carol? So 
this is really directed to Dove. I obviously speak with a lot of people who have different, very different opinions than mine. People who say, oh no, the occupation has to be because of security for Israel. And I know, it's not just an opinion, but I know for a fact, this makes Israel so insecure, there is nothing that could make Israel more secure. I talk to people that say, but the Jews have a right to Israel. And I have no idea what this right might be from God, from lawyers, whatever it is. My problem is that I am totally unlike you. And when faced with those people, I feel inside this boiling anger toward them for being so wrong, so pig-headed. And as you can imagine, this is not an effective strategy. <laughs> so what can I do, and I'm serious about this, what can I do to kind of be a yogi and smooth myself out and be able to address people with views that I have, I don't think that they're just different views. I think they're dead wrong. And it's a bad way to feel because once you feel that somebody is totally wrong, you're really not talking to them. So give me psychological help and tell me, <laughs> seriously, what can I do to be a much more effective communicator? Well, you put a much bigger challenge for me than I can be able to meet. And psychology is uh, not my profession. Uh, we, I have a psychologist in, in my family, but it's not me. Uh, however, my attitude to people is that many, many people are very wrong, and many people are very angry, and many people are very frightened. And all these things should be, first of all, understood, you know? When people, for example, are angry, perhaps they are wrong, but there is a basis for their anger, you know, because, for example, war is something horrible for the Palestinians, of course, but it is horrible also for the Israelis. So they are angry. They are angry on the Palestinians, which is, I think, wrong, but the anger I can understand. Or people are frightened, and I think we should not overlook they are fear. They are really frightened. And, and, but instead of overlooking or ridiculing their fear, what we should do is try to persuade them that they are afraid, and justly so, but we have an answer to the fear, which is a different answer than the, the, the answer of the establishment. As you said, you know, our basic story is very, very simple, very simple. Israel is a very small state with 8 million people. It is inside a big, a huge area of hundreds of millions of Arabs and Muslims, and we have only two options. Either we get well with our neighbors, or we do not get well with our neighbors. If we get well with our neighbors, that is peace, with, with a lot of problems, we have to overcome many difficult issues, refugees, Jerusalem, settlements, very, very difficult problems. But if we want to achieve peace, we should deal with all these problems. That is one option. If we do not get well with our neighbors, then we will continue to fight. And in each war, there will be more dead people and more suffering, more hatred, more problems. Israel is a very strong state. It can succeed in the next war or in the war again, uh, after the next war. But, you know, what is the end? You know, in the third or the fourth or the fifth war, Israel also can lose. And it, it won't exist anymore. So if people really care for their own people, if Israelis care, really care for themselves, not only if they care for the Palestinians, they have to understand that this challenge of achieving a solution whereby there will be justice for the Palestinians and for the Israelis, this is their own interest. 
And this is the thing I, I try to persuade people. It's not a very, very complicated thesis. It's a very simple one. And I think that, well, if you think about it, well, the other side do not have any alternative. I speak with these people in the Knesset, you know, with, even with Prime Minister Netanyahu and others. And, well, I hear that, well, you have the Hamas and you have Iran and every, everyone is very, very bad and so on. So I ask them, you know, even if what you say about Hamas and Iran is, is correct, what is your program? You know, you are the leader of Israel. What is your program to secure the future of your people? What is, your, what is the program? Aside of more wars with, with an endless, you know, road. And I have to tell you openly, they do not have any answer. So we are the only ones who have an answer. It's not an easy one, but it is an answer. They do not have any alternative. Um, before I let Libby um, close this up, I actually wanted just to um, say three quick things. One um, of uh, a moment of hope. First of all, I have a lot of hope for, thanks to the four people on this panel and the work that the New Israel Fund is doing. And um, most of all, it's actually the hope of the people in this audience who come here on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah, it is cold outside, but, um, but there are other warm places to go and are engaging with this topic and our amazing community that came out last night for a Shabbat dinner. And this doesn't happen in other places in the country. This probably doesn't happen in Israel much. Um, but they sit at a Shabbat dinner with Mira Awad and with Aboud, who is, uh, from, who's a Samaritan, and has his film here this week. And people will come to other films. And Dov Hanim's film, by the way, for those of you who haven't bought tickets yet, is Sunday night. Um, and coming and discussing and passing this message along. And I feel so lucky to be in a community like this one. So um, thank you all. And Libby, I hand things over to you for final words. Thanks. Thank you so much to our four um, speakers. It was really an honor. And, uh, and <laughs> um, thank you, Libby. Thank, thanks, everyone. Thank you, Carol and Yitzi and the other Israel Film Festival. And see you tonight, tomorrow, tomorrow night, and throughout the rest of the festival. Thanks a lot. Thank you. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more. And we're especially pleased to remind you that thanks to a generous matching gift from the Cayley family, Every new or increased dollar you donate to JBS will be worth double to JBS. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.